Yorana, Talofalava, Malo Elele, um, Lihan Mastelel. Um, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. I, I was here four years ago for the Salon du Livre, and um, it's just wonderful to be back home again. My profuse apologies to the translators. Um, you're just going to have to freestyle. I'm sorry. I will go slow. <laughs> Um, I've titled this talk, uh, Led by Line, which is a literary framing device that I've devised that weaves together bloodlines, written lines, spoken lines, and drawn lines to nourish and beautify decolonial spaces between storylines, body lines, and landlines. It's a way of appreciating Pacific literature a form of literary analysis that keeps making and doing, creating at its center. My paper draws on the lines on my hands to take you on a quick anti-linear exploration that focuses on my work as a Pacifica artist, academic, and my epistemological practice of restoring and retelling and restoring Pacific myths in order to address, among other things, our current environmental crisis. The theme of this conference is politics in Oceania. I follow in the footsteps of great poetry foremothers like Audrey Lord and Alice Walker, Hawaii's Haunani K. Trask and Tonga's Gornai Halu Thayman and Vanuatu's Grace Meromolisa that the most political thing you can do is to be, think, write, speak, sing, pray, chant, draw, and dance the poem in your bones. I marked my 49th birthday by receiving a tua lima, the traditional Samoan woman's back tua of the hand lima, tattoo. My hands are home to earth, sky, and sea. My skin wriggles with worms and centipedes, soars with seabirds, swims with fish, octopus, and jellyfish, and are speckled with stars, portals into the next life. ta ta tau, the customary form of Samoan tattooing, are created by puncturing the skin with a tiny comb lined with razor-sharp shark's teeth or boar's tusks or, more recently, steel needles. The straight edge of the comb means that symbols are made by connecting thousands of minute lines together. It always starts with a single line, an aso. These inked body lines reflect lines of connection to landlines, Lines made by, in, and around earth, water, and air, and by their natural inhabitants. Some of these lines of connection have been jeopardized, for many completely severed in our post-colonial era. The numerous founding isms of post-colonialism, imperialism, colonialism, capitalism, racism, sexism, genderism, to name a few, exacerbate, if not been the direct cause of our current environmental crises. Disconnection between our body lines and our land lines has been detrimental to the health and well-being of our, environmental, uh, of our environment and of ourselves. In many pre-colonial indigenous societies, body lines and land lines were interrelational, interdependent, and enable the other to mutually flourish. But this common sense knowing eludes many Western modern day societies, but it's something many of us yearn for. My scholarly centering of Tatao follows a line of inquiry laid down 26 years ago by Moalai Vau Albert Went in his oft cited essay, Tatawing the Postcolonial Body, first published in 1996. Almost four decades after independence was first won in the Pacific, Wendt asks, 
how post-colonial is the interdisciplinary field of humanities in which a decolonizing agenda was purportedly embraced? Wentz's extended definition of the word post and post-colonial means before, during, after, and alongside colonialism, and it's often cited to challenge political complacency among our independent islands in this heralded post-colonial era. Almost three decades later, I too wonder how decolonial our lines actually are. I'm not the only one. It's 2018. I've been made the Commonwealth poet and I'm commissioned to write and perform a poem for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II at Westminster Abbey for Commonwealth Observance Day. I've published on this experience in The Guardian and wrote a graphic memoir on it, Mophead II, The Queen's Poem. Here's a scene that took place after the performance when guests were invited to line up and meet the royal family. It's part of a real life exchange. After the performance, the Queen admired the poem. How did you memorize that long poem? It's my job, Your Majesty, I'm a poet. Yes, I suppose it is, well done. The Duke forgot the poem. So, what do you do? I'm a poet, Your Royal Highness. I just perform back there. What is not in the book is the next exchange I had with Prince Philip. Dissatisfied with my initial answer of, I'm a poet, the Duke asked me again, yes, yes, but what do you do? <laughs> to which I answered, I'm a lecturer at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, and I specialize in post-colonial literature. The Duke responded with one word before moving down the line. Post. <laughs> the following year, at the Byron Bay Writers' Festival in Australia, I shared a panel with Bunjalung Indigenous Australian writer Melissa Lukashenko. I just finished sharing the story when Melissa leaned into my mic and shouted, the old buggers got it right for once. <laughs> the aso, a single line, also refers to the ribbed coconut palm that thatches roofs of Samoan and Fale. The ivi aso aso also refers to the ribs within our bodies. The aso is the framework for everything. Moi lua, two lines sleeping. If you draw two lines side by side on a piece of paper, how many lines are there? Two? Three, when you count the white line of space in between. My doctorate was about seeing the published yet invisible lines of first wave Pacific woman poets. I identified how their lines define the lines of others around them and how we make these seen, unseen spaces count. In 2004, I composed a poem in order to bring the lines of first wave Pacific woman poets together, led by line. We are led by line. Bloodline, love line, land line. The stitched line is a fine line when out of line with the colonial line. We are led by line, horizon line, body line, fault line, fissure line is out of line with the imperial line, the buried head in the sand line. We are led by line, lining up our spoken lines, broken lines of disintegrating harmonies, when we realign, laying it on the line, by drawing our line in the sand. Led by line captures the collective, creative, personal and political lines written, stitched, spoken and drawn when breaking, 
upending and provoking colonial and post-colonial lines on, in, and around indigenous body lines and land lines. Now that's a line. And here's a cover. This is the book that I'm working on, a world-first graphic critical poetry anthology where I write and draw my connection to our first 16 first wave Pacific woman poets uh, in Oceania. I call myself a Pacifica artist academic with the hyphen in the middle and the hyphen stands for the Samoan principle of the va, the interrelational space between two people, between groups of people, between people and the environment. Here, the black lines in the letter V and the upturned A echo the tracks of the navigational birds, the ngongo sina, or the tern, and the tuli, the plover, found throughout Samoan tattoo symbology and on my skin. The line that makes the difference is the red line, the red horizontal bridge which peaks the upturned V and turns, and turns, T-E-R-N-S, bird footprints into letters of the alphabet. This visual depiction of the interrelational space between pictorial and semantic lines turn these lines into the word va. This red mythic bloodline forms the hyphen, the bridge, the ala, the final three letters in my bloodline name, Tusi Tala, and the connected space between my role as artist academic. Vaituli, Pacific Glover, Plo Golden Plover, the action of walking and coming together. I invented a word the other day, episti mythology, where epistemology, mythology, and methodology overlap, an interweaving of spoken, written, and drawn lines with bloodline mythologies. Epistemythology is a method showing how we can center creative ways of knowing, doing, and being, episteme, so we can reason about and tell, logos, our stories, mythos, and restore the va. I share two examples later. How much time have I got, Colleen? 12 minutes, 6 minutes. I'm going by Colleen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Turns return. This is the Ngongo Sina. Following the flight of the turn, we recognize that the mythic past holds knowledge that can help us navigate the present. This does not mean foisting arcane myths onto our kids. It means restoring by restoring the timeless wisdoms held within myths and recognizing them as epistemological portals. We keep myths alive by passing them down through spoken, written, and drawn lines. Myths keep us alive. My first example that I want to share is a myth that I restoried with my Ni Vanuatu colleague, Dr. Pala Molissa. Uh, Pala talked to his now late father, Sela Molissa, who was Minister of Finance when uh, Vanuatu won its independence from 73 years of an Anglo-French condominium. Sela Molissa got this story from his father, Ripai Mande Tutuhon. Uh, with Sela's permission, we were able to muck about with the story so that it could carry on really uh, important concepts for us like staying connected with our bodies in order to stay connected with the land. Many versions of this myth exist orally, and they are passed down through the body and respoken, restoried, and restore um, elemental ways of being. Um, in sum, the essential elements of the myth remain. There is a young boy called the Galmarai, there's a river and the eel, the river guardian, it's, it's sacred guardian. 
the people are tasked with remembering the eels' names through their rituals, through their yearly rituals. But slowly, as work and church and industry take over, they uh, fail at remembering the sacred eels' names. He stops coming out of his hole. The river starts to die. Thank you. Um, so there's an erosion of a collective memory when the names are forgotten. Names hold the stories of a people. Story hold, stories hold people's magic. Uh, my second example, we've got five minutes left, is based on the Fetu symbol, stars, that represent our ancestors. Like stars, we receive the light of our ancestors long after they've died. So remembering our mythic ancestors was really important in this graphic novel, Mophead 2. As was uh, the alu alu, the jellyfish. And this Samoan symbol belongs only to women. And when I asked my tofunga why, she said, well, it's fringing tentacles are beautiful to see and soft to touch. But if you step on one, you're dead. So mop head is my unruly tentacle head, self-drawn alter ego. And she's the epitome of girl power. In 2019, uh, she gatecrashed the New Zealand Book Awards and did a clean sweep at the New Zealand Children and Young Persons um, Awards, which surprised everyone, including myself. But she struck a chord with the New Zealand reading public. And I guess it's because at, the, at her heart, uh, she argues that difference makes the difference. And so the sequel of uh, Mophead is Mopheads 2, uh, Mophead 2. And um, the dilemma that I faced as Commonwealth poet was on, this, on the uh, screen there, can I stand up for my people who struggled against the Queen and still serve the Queen? I got out my journal. Where do I stand? The answers were inside me. So we decide that the platform of Westminster Abbey was too important um, to not accept because I could get my politics on a global stage, which is summed up here. Um, I needed to build a bridge from London's smoggy streets to the sinking sands in the South Seas. My grandfather, Tusitala, was born in Tuvalu, in the island of New Tau, and that is uh, the most pressing issue for us at the moment. So after I was uh, given the commission, I was told of the Queen's rules, which turned me inside out and round about, but I thought, no, no, this is worth it because I can talk about the sinking island of Tuvalu, except the fifth rule that they gave me was that the poem was not allowed to be political. So Mophead had to think about whether floating piglets were political or not. Uh, I found the line, the magic line, the Allah, that space that bridges, uh, that, that nourishes the va in um, the poem. There's an eye in unity. And then while keeping the politics intact, I draw on our Pacific mythic um, inspirators. So I draw on that Polynesian uh, rebellious hero Maui. I draw on the Samoan goddess Nafanua. And um, I draw on Naini Manoa from Kiribati. They only changed one word in the poem, which was the word colonial. I had to take that out. And then I decided I didn't need that anyway. Um, on my, before I got my tattoo, I visited Samoa and Tui Atua Tupua Tamasese, former Samoan Prime Minister, Head of State, preeminent authority on pre-colonial indigenous belief systems. I said, what's the most important symbol for you? And he took my journal and he, he did a squiggle and I was like, really? <laughs> but this is the ilo, this is the worm, this is our DNA, this is why many words in our languages um, 
the many words for earth and land also mean placenta and blood. And um, if you want to hear more about the story, I've got a few copies of the book available at the Salon du Livre. So come up to me and I'll um, put some aside. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.